Hey guys, it's Coach Ramsey. I'm sitting here at the Houston airport uh, with my wife. Hi. We're getting ready to fly out. I'm sorry to not be with you. Uh, you will be watching this tomorrow morning because right now it's Thursday night and I apologize for the background noise because I am at the airport. But here is your uh, presentation for today um, that I would have been giving today on diffraction. Hopefully it'll help answer a lot of the questions that you might have as you go through the textbook problems. So let's go ahead and get started. This will be pretty quick. Feel free to pause and rewind if I talk too quickly. To start with, diffraction um, happens because of interference. It's a total product of interference and it's the phenomenon of light bending as it goes through a very small opening uh, and creating patterns. And so one of the characteristic, characteristics of a wave is the ability for it to undergo interference. There's two types of interference. If waves are in phase, then they go through what we call constructive interference. If uh, waves are out of phase, which means the crests and, crests and troughs line up, then that means we call those waves out of phase. Spots. Um, and we call these, we, we name these, we'll talk a bit more about those names later. And then the blue dots here represent nodal points. This is where you might see some dark spots. Diffraction happens in a variety of different ways. It's normally taken to refer to various phenomena which occur when a wave encounters an obstacle. So over on the left you see light uh, waves passing through an opening, um, and on the right here you see waves bending as they go around an obstacle. And this is a picture I'm going to be referring to for the next few slides. This is a picture of a laser being shone through uh, two different slits. This is called a double slit diffraction pattern and you see this center there, you see a really bright light and then you see a couple little lights diffracting outwards. And so let's talk for just a moment about this central maximum. Suppose you have two sources of light, each being allowed to emit a wave through a small opening or slit. When, these, when the light passes through these slits, it's going to be in phase. And so when they come together, uh, you can see this kind of forms an isosceles triangle here, meaning these two sides of this triangle are congruent, they travel the same distance, which means they're going to come together and completely constructively interfere. That's where you get the really bright band. The distance between the slits, so when we talk about it mathematically, the distance between the slits we call D. The distance from the slit spacing to the screen is given by L. And if two waves go through the slit and then proceed straight ahead to the screen, they both cover the same distance. Like I said, it's completely constructive interference at the central maximum. A graph on the left here shows what it looks like with the, uh, the relative intensity between the different bands. And notice how in figure two, this is the picture that I showed before, there are several bright spots and dark areas in between. The spot in the middle is the brightest, and so we call that the central minimum, and we call those smaller spots fringes. Notice the intensity is a bit less in these fringes. We call these bright spots different orders of diffraction. So the first bright spot is called the first order, the second bright spot the second order, and so forth. Like I said, the first order is called order. We call that M1. We use the letter M to represent the order of the fringe from the bright central. And so you have M equals 2 as the second order bright fringe. It's important you understand that the bright fringes are a result of complete constructive interference. Now, when we talk about these bright fringes, let's look back at this original picture. What if we're not looking at the central maximum? What happens is you see at certain points, whenever the two lines travel, the two beams of light travel alongside each other and come to meet on the screen, there's a certain point at which the two path lengths are actually, they actually make up for that difference. And one wave, in this case the blue wave, actually travels farther than the red wave to reach the screen. For the blue wave and the red wave to build constructively, remember they must be in phase. So how much further did the blue wave have to travel so that they both hit the screen in phase? the question we'll go in with. Well, path difference, if we look at it, how far, how much further does it have to travel for them to be in phase? Well, it has to travel exactly one wavelength. Uh, so we call this extra distance the path difference. Um, and whenever we talk about the path difference, you notice that there's one wavelength, uh, and this is verified in experiment. experiment. There's one wavelength between the central and first order maxima, and between uh, the first order maxima and the second. So there's a total distance of two lambda. Um, and it's pretty cool uh, to notice that this is always true with these bright bands. The path difference is always equal to the order times the wavelength. is m lambda, where we plug in m being the order of the band. 
Okay, let's talk about the dark fringes for just a moment because there is something equally as simple but slightly different. There's a definite decrease in, in intensity in between these bright fringes. In the pattern, you notice the dark region. These are the areas where destructive interference has occurred. At these minima, we have other, we, call, we use the same notation. We call the zero order, though, um, because the central maximum was technically the zero order bright fringe. The zero order dark fringe is m equals zero. The first order dark fringe, which is the second dark band, is m equals one, and so forth and so on. And these dark fringes, again, it's important to understand that these are a result of destructive interference. Uh, some of them constructively interfere to cause the bright bands. Some of them destructively interfere to cause the dark bands. And where does the dark fringe destructive interference occur? How does this happen in path length? As you see in this picture, as it turns out to have them be um, completely out of phase, it has to be a distance of, as you see over here, lambda over 2. So how much further did the blue wave have to travel so that they hit the screen exactly out of phase? Well, half of a wavelength. The dark fringes on either side are multiple wavelengths from the bright central, so we've got to be careful here. We have half of a wavelength from the central maxima to the zeroth order minimum, and then 1.5, so we add, remember, from here on out we add in orders of lambda. And so the zeroth order is, is half a wavelength, the first order is one and a half wavelengths, the second order is two and a half wavelengths, and so forth. So therefore the path difference is equal to the order plus a half uh, times the wavelength. And this is where you see destructive interference. So in summary, we have two equations. We know that constructive interference happens where the path difference is m times lambda, and destructive interference happens where the path difference is m plus one half quantity times lambda, where m is the order. Now let's talk about where this actually comes into play. Well, Young, Thomas Young, in 1801, uh, the Young, this is often referred to as Young's double slit experiment, shows that light does actually produce an interference pattern. This was absolutely crucial in proving that light has wave properties. And this uh, material is what Einstein looked at when he was making his theory of the photoelectric effect that he then verified in, um, in experiment. So here's what Young did. You have two slits separated by a distance d, and they're at a distance l from the screen. Uh, let p be any bright fringe, right? And we see that we can make a right triangle using l, which is the distance from the slits to the screen. y, which is the screen itself, the distance from the bright maximum to whatever point p that is. And then the angle, we'll use angle theta, will be the angle between um, the middle, right, right in between the two slits, and uh, point p. And you can find this angle using the tangent. And so this angle is very easily findable. So you know the, the tangent of theta, whenever we're talking about this angle, we're referring to this angle, is the quantity y over l. So here's another way to look at path difference. Right? We talked about it before using uh, <clears throat> just intuition. Now let's look and say, OK, this path difference is something significant. We already know that it's going to be a wavelength to create a bright band. But when I do a little bit of geometry, there's two similar right triangles. There's this right triangle right here, which we know the angle is given by the tangent of that angle is y over l. That also creates a similar right triangle whose height right here happens to be equal to the path difference. And so this uses just a little bit of trigonometry to make our calculations incredibly simple. And you'll see. So if the path difference here is calculated by d sine theta, remember d is the distance between the slits, the theta is just the angle here, and we get that by relating the distance the slits are from the screen and the distance this band is from the screen. And so, when we put it together, we know that path difference for bright bands is n lambda, for dark bands is n plus 1 half lambda. We know that <clears throat> the path difference is also equal to d sine theta, and so we can come up with this beautiful equation um, for constructive interference. We have d sine theta equals m lambda. That's the bright bands. And then for destructive interference, that same d sine theta is going to give us m plus 1 half times lambda. But don't forget, we can always easily find this angle theta by plugging it into this tangent theta equals y over l. Now, two examples and then we're done. First, a viewing screen is separated from a double slit source by 1.2 meters. If the distance between the two slits is 0 0.03 millimeters, and the second order bright fringe is four and a half centimeters from the central maximum, 
determine the wavelength. And given L, I'm given D, which is the separation between the two slit. M is 2, it's the second order bright fringe, M equals 2. The Y, which if you remember, is the distance the bright, uh, bright fringe is from the central maximum. The first thing, I'm given the L and the Y, so why not find the angle? So the inverse tangent of this fraction gives us the angle, which is 2.15 degrees. So it's a very small angle, but when I go and then plug it into my angle to, t to determine the wavelength of the light, I know the M, and I know the distance between the fringes, and I know the angle now, or the distance between the slits, and I know the angle now. So all I do is plug it into the equation, and I get a wavelength of 5.62 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Couldn't be much simpler than that. Second example, let's look at this. Light with a wavelength of 450 nanometers falls under diffraction grating, which is multiple slits. On a screen 1.8 meters away, the distance between dark on either side of the bright central is 4.2 millimeters. What's the separation between a set of slits? And how many lines per meter are on the grating? Well, if we look at this, we know that we're given the wavelength of the light, given the distance from the screen to the slits, and we're given the separation, or the distance between the fringes, which is, remember, if the, the fringes are 4.2 millimeters away, the distance they are from the bright central is half of that, which is uh, 2.1 millimeters. So the first thing we can do is go ahead and solve for this angle. So the inverse tangent of those sides is 0 0.067 degrees, so a very small angle. Now, in order to find the D, which is the separation between the slits, which is what we're looking for, all we do is plug it in, solve, and we get... Uh, 1.9 times 10 to the negative fourth meters. And then last, we finish off to fi by finding the, dis the meters per line. This is a very easy algebraic uh, way to solve it. And so the separation, the li lines per meter, um, which is what we're looking for, is just, uh, just over 5,000 lines. And there you have it. Good luck with your practice problems. Shoot me a message if you have questions. Good luck, and have a great weekend.